A recent study has suggested that the surface of Mars is coated in a layer of potent chemicals that are toxic to life. If correct, this could have important implications for the search for life on the Red Planet. So today I'm going to critically examine the results of this study and discuss what it could mean for future human missions to Mars. Last week, a study from the University of Edinburgh, published in the journal Scientific Reports, presented evidence from a series of laboratory experiments that suggested that chemical compounds, called perchlorates, are harmful to life when illuminated by ultraviolet radiation. There seems to be a lot of confusion going around, though, about the issue of perchlorates on Mars. So I want to clear this all up. Firstly, perhaps a little background on what perchlorates actually are. Simply put, a perchlorate is a chemical species that contains the ion ClO4-, which is just a chlorine atom bonded to four oxygen atoms with an overall negative charge. This means that it can form ionic bonds with positively charged metal ions to form compounds such as sodium perchlorate and magnesium perchlorate. Perchlorates are stable at room temperature, but at higher temperatures they are highly oxidizing. What that means is that they have an affinity for taking away electrons from other molecules. The implications for biology are twofold. Firstly, by stripping away electrons, strongly oxidizing substances can disrupt chemical bonds in bacteria. This can rupture the cell wall, disrupt internal chemistry, and damage the DNA in the cells. However, there are some microbes on the Earth that actually exploit the way perchlorates absorb electrons to create an energy gradient to sustain themselves. But again, I emphasize that perchlorates under normal conditions are relatively harmless to bacteria, and it is only upon heating that they become particularly oxidizing. On Earth, we usually don't speak much about perchlorates, and that's because they have a quite low concentration in most soils. However, on Mars, for every kilogram of soil, as much as 10 grams can be perchlorates. The first conclusive detection of perchlorates on Mars was made by NASA's Phoenix lander in 2008, which inferred a mixture of calcium perchlorate and magnesium perchlorate comprising approximately 0.6% of the soil. There were then similar concentrations seen by the Curiosity rover in Gale Crater a few years later. But to be clear, we only have direct detections of perchlorates in these two specific locations on the Martian surface. Though that being said, orbital maps of subsurface chlorine from the gamma-ray spectrometer on the Mars Odyssey satellite have also reported levels around 0.5%, which does suggest, at least, that perchlorate could be globally distributed, at least in the top 10 centimetres or so of Martian soil. It's still not entirely clear why perchlorates are so common on Mars compared to the Earth. Though one idea is that ancient Martian volcanoes ejected plumes of materials into the atmosphere, which contained hydrochloric acid. In the upper atmosphere, this hydrochloric acid could have then reacted with ozone in the presence of ultraviolet radiation to form perchlorates in a very gradual process that over millions of years would have coated most of the surface of Mars in the perchlorates that we see today. So now that we have a little bit of background on perchlorates, where does this new study come in that's been making the rounds? Two researchers at the University of Edinburgh, PhD candidate Jennifer Wadsworth and astrobiology professor Charles Cockell, who incidentally has a great book on astrobiology that I highly recommend. They decided to investigate what happens to perchlorates when you irradiate them with ultraviolet light. Because you have to remember that Mars doesn't have an ozone layer like the Earth. And so the surface is bathed in ultraviolet radiation that penetrates up to a few millimetres beneath the surface. The researchers took one particular bacterial strain, Bacillus subtilis, and irradiated it with ultraviolet light under a few varying environmental conditions, both with and without magnesium perchlorate present. In most of the cases they investigated, they found that the bacteria were destroyed more rapidly when perchlorate was present, 
which suggested that the perchlorates were converted into highly oxidizing chemicals by the ultraviolet radiation. Whilst their results are relatively clear for the specific conditions that they investigated, I am not entirely convinced that their experimental results are reflective of the environmental conditions present on the surface of Mars today. For example, all of their experiments were conducted above the freezing point of water, with actually most of them at 25 Celsius, instead of minus 55 degrees Celsius as would be typical on Mars. And all of their experiments involved either a liquid solution with perchlorates dissolved in them, or disks of material meant to simulate rocks, which were soaked in these solutions. Now when perchlorates are already dissolved in solution, I imagine that the bacterial uptake would be substantially higher than on most of the surface of Mars, where the perchlorate compounds are just a dry component of the dust on the Martian surface. So in short time, I'm quite sceptical that the results of these experiments can be extrapolated to the entire surface of Mars. In particular, the observation that one particular bacterial strain became unviable under these conditions does not imply that the same holds generally for all microbial life. I mean, for instance, there are highly acidic environments here on the Earth that some microorganisms thrive in, whilst others would certainly not be viable. I do want to emphasise here that it is the ultraviolet radiation that is the problem, not the perchlorates. As control samples with perchlorates present but without UV did not show any significant loss of bacteria. Indeed, samples with no perchlorates still lost the majority of their bacteria after 60 seconds of exposure. Sure, UV and perchlorates together may have killed the bacteria slightly quicker, but it's somewhat of a moot point if the ultraviolet radiation alone kills the bacteria anyway. In any case, even a few millimetres beneath the surface of Mars, the amount of UV radiation is negligible. So this effect should only really alter what's going on in the upper layers of the Martian soil. In other words, the habitability of deep layers, such as will be investigated by the European Space Agency's ExoMars rover, will not be compromised by UV radiation in this manner. It is also worth noting that the research has found that if you reduce the amount of perchlorates in the Martian soil, by just a factor of 10, then they see no statistically significant evidence that bacteria were lost at an enhanced rate. Overall then, after reading their paper, I don't believe sweeping conclusions that Mars is coated in toxic chemicals are justified, at least with the present published results. But please don't take my opinion just at face value here. I encourage you all to read the paper and come to your own independent conclusions. As, unfortunately, I think this is a case where the reporting of these results in the media has not been entirely reflective of the science. Indeed, it's very clear that more research is still required, especially in environmental conditions analogous to the present surface on Mars, and we need to look at a wide range of different bacterial strains. There also needs to be more work specifically identifying which chemical derivatives of perchlorates are being produced by the ultraviolet light, and what the mechanism is which enables these chemicals to destroy bacteria. In any case, putting my scepticism aside, if these results are correct, then there could actually be some beneficial side effects for human missions to Mars. Because an ever-pressing concern is the prospect of accidentally contaminating Mars with microorganisms from the Earth, which could undermine the search for native Martian life. But if the surface is truly coated in UV-activated oxidizing compounds, then the risk of this happening would lower dramatically, potentially easing the level of necessity for planetary protection precautions on the surface of Mars. Up to this point, though, we have only really looked at the effect of perchlorates on bacteria. So I want to turn now to examine what these chemicals can do to humans if we are exposed to them. Let's say you breathe in some dust on Mars that contains perchlorates following a surface excursion. Or perhaps you drink some water that was contaminated with perchlorates. What would happen to you? Well, the main effect of perchlorates on the body is to disrupt the uptake of iodine into the thyroid gland, 
which prevents the production of hormones that regulates our body's metabolism. This can adversely affect our ability to regulate temperatures, maintain sleep cycles, it can harm our mood and our appetite, and generally slows the function of many bodily organs. It's really important to emphasise though, that perchlorates aren't like some kind of poison. It's not like ingesting cyanide. You need to be exposed to them consistently for a prolonged period of time, and the damaging effects are entirely reversible. In fact, perchlorates typically stay in the body for only a few hours following exposure. Estimates vary as to what levels should be safe to humans in the long term, but they're typically around one microgram per kilogram of body weight per day, which is the kind of dose you would be exposed to after breathing in a few milligrams of Martian dust. Another pressing issue that still needs to be established is whether the perchlorates that we've inferred on Mars are present in the ice deposits beneath the surface. Because if there are perchlorates, then these would need to be filtered out of any drinking water that we produce from this ice. So what are some ways that we could minimise our exposure to perchlorates? Well, there are various mechanical ways such as washdown sprays, dust suppression systems, or perhaps what you could do is you could have surface suits attached to the exterior of the habitat that you step into the back of them so that you don't go through an airlock, for instance. There is, however, a simple and elegant way, which I quite like, that you could also use to deal with perchlorates. It's a biochemical process that produces oxygen as a useful byproduct. The idea is to take perchlorates and expose them to two purified enzymes, perchlorate reductase and chloride dismutase, which together convert the perchlorates into molecular oxygen and the chloride ion, which is just harmless. This way, perchlorates could actually serve as part of an in situ resource utilization system to produce oxygen on Mars, instead of relying solely on electrolysis of water. In fact, the perchlorates present in just 60 kilograms of Martian soil could provide 550 litres of oxygen if you were to break down at all, and all it would take to do this would be around 100 grams of purified enzymes, with a little over one hour for the reaction to take place. So it may be the case that perchlorates could actually become a highly useful and valuable resource for human settlements on Mars. If you'd like to delve into this in greater depth, I'll post a number of links below to studies on Martian perchlorates. One in particular that I highly recommend is a study that appeared in the International Journal of Astrobiology a few years ago on the risks and potential uses of perchlorates on Mars. I hope this video helped to clarify that perchlorates aren't a deadly substance that is a fundamental barrier for future human missions to Mars. Sure, they present some challenges, but equally they offer us opportunities. They are a resource that we can use. Because that is what we do. We innovate. We adapt to our environment. And that truth will be as true on Mars as it is on the Earth. Thanks for watching. Last time, I explained how astronomers like myself extract the properties of exoplanet atmospheres from observations. I couldn't agree more with James's comment, as I always strive on this channel to explain why something is true, which you often can't do without graphs and an equation or two. Stefan had a great question about compounding assumptions and distinguishing between different molecules. I left him a detailed answer in the comments, but I'd like to stress that most current measurements with Hubble today are about precise enough to distinguish between water and methane, but not much more than that. Last but not least, Cantal Zero ended with a lovely note that our observations of exoplanets today is but the first step to one day visiting these alien worlds. And now to wrap up, I have a special preview for the next video on this channel. But it's fascinating to think about if Mars once was a potentially habitable planet, whether we could turn back the clock, if you will, and make Mars a more hospitable planet in the future which is a process that we call terraforming, literally making an Earth. There are a number of ideas for how you could try and warm up Mars, ranging from somewhat crazy ideas to simpler ideas that would just take longer. So some ideas that I've seen is you could actually have mirrors floating in orbit around Mars 
that focus light from the sun onto the poles. The next giant leap is a short documentary shot here in Cambridge that explores why we need to build a human settlement on Mars. It will be released on this channel at 1400 hours UTC on Saturday 22nd July. In the meantime, please let me know if you have any outstanding questions on Martian perchlorates or any other topics down below, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the latest developments in Mars exploration and exoplanet science.